and welcome or welcome back to my channel my name is Nyambura and this is 100 on looks today I'm going to do the first of this year's weekly roundups yes I know I did one in January but like one that's about books that I've read in 2023 because whew, I have done more than one monthly wrap up and that stuff is hard and I'm just impressed with people who are able to do that stuff on booktube because you my memory and the notes I'm not taking I'm so far in. Anyway, let's get into it because otherwise we'll be here forever. The first book I... Oh, wait. I forgot to mention. This is for the books I read in the week ending 17th March 2023. So the first of those was Unruly Saint, Dorothy Day's Radical Vision and Its Challenge for Our Times by D.L. Mayfield, narrated by Sarah Zimmerman. I first heard about this via Anne Helen Peterson's newsletter. I'll put a link to the particular entry downstairs. And it sounded so interesting. I put a hold and when it came in, I was so excited to listen to it. And so we follow, as the title suggests, Dorothy Day's life and, you know, like some ruminations in this particular context, you know, post-2020, post-Trump, post-ETC, um, of like the author D.L. Mayfield's thoughts on what it means to be a Christian and to have a liberatory politic and a politic that centers the poor, the marginalized um, in one's theology via, and we think about this through the context of Dorothy Day, who was um, Catholic socialist, anarchist, thinker, writer, worker, um, who really believed in faith via works, which is something I wish more people went in for because I live in a country right now where there is a lot of pushback, as in a lot of African countries, to be honest, against people who are queer, for instance. And it's a bit like, so y'all care about queer people's business, but you don't care about all those hungry children and all the mismanagement of public resources and so on and so forth. So, I don't know, it was just really heartening to listen to it and to think about its ideas. And it's a sort of book I'm actually contemplating picking up a copy of just to highlight and to really sit with those ideas and to think about how, for some of us, we've thought of religion as the thing one goes to or goes away from if one wants to embrace certain ideas of togetherness and socialism and so on and so forth. And then a book like this comes along that asks you, why not both? And really, why not both? Next was, I have some questions for you by Rebecca Mackay. This is a really hot book right now. And Olive over at A Book Olive did a really good review of it. I'll put a link below because it really captures a lot of what I felt by the time I was done reading this, like, is this it? Like, you guys are praising this book up and down, and for what? For what? The gag is, I got this book on release date, and I actually, I'm not proud of myself, but I co tweeted the author, and I was like, oh, I'm so excited that I've gotten this book on release date. What are the chances? ETC, ETC, ETC. And so this book follows our main character, Body Kane, as she, um, <laughs> goes to her old boarding school a school she went to because of a series of events so even though she did not come from a rich family she was able to have a patron who sent her to a fancy boarding school in the east coast of the US which I think is where all the fancy stuff happens in the US it seems and so while she was there in her last year of high school a girl was found murdered and the man who was sent to prison for it was the like, chief athletics guy who happened to be a black man. And now she's back running a podcasting class. She has a quite a large podcast with a huge following, you know, lots of sponsors, ETC, ETC. And as somebody who's been listening to podcasts for 10 odd years and paying attention to that world, you know, I can imagine what sort of show she has. And so... She's gone back to her old high school to teach a podcasting class and a film class because she's a professor in film studies. As she, oh, I forgot to mention, the podcast is about, you know, starlets and so on. 
film starlet so you know all her walls sort of, sort of coming together in the classes she's teaching and one of the kids in her podcasting classes hey the thing podcast i'd like to make is one that interrogates the murder of this girl and the fact that this lone black man or one of the, maybe the few black people on campus was the one that was charged and convicted with her murder you know i should have known this was not going to go well because this is the same rebecca mckay who wrote the unbelievers that people were praising up and down but i found a bit concerning and underwhelming not underwhelming but concerning because she wrote a book that was really about the AIDS crisis in the city of Chicago that managed to barely have any black people in Chicago. I don't know if people who are racialized as white don't see black people or they don't imagine them in history or something like that, but it felt like this grown up, because I mean, she's not young at the point this is happening. She's 40 maybe the main character is maybe 40 at the point at which the story begins but she's just like oh yes you know there is something to be said about a black man being accused of killing a white girl oh yeah these are things we've noticed in true crime dramas it's taking you 20 odd years for you to have these thoughts and i'm not gonna lie the kids are all right because the kids in this story came out sounding much smarter and you know, in touch with reality. You know, they sounded like they touched grass on occasion. Because she just sounded so guileless. And I say this in the most what was going on there way. And then there's a subplot, which really does nothing for anything, that involves her husband being me too What was that for? What was it for? And she uses that bit, the author uses that bit to, oh sorry, Bodhi, who is the narrator of the story, uses that bit to try and um, insert some race analysis where she's like, oh no, you know, I can't believe my husband's and after, soon afterwards ex-husband's accuser identifies as a woman of color because the whole time I was saying some of these things about her, I thought she was white, like, wow. Why are black and brown people's names in some of you people's mouths? Like, what is the reason, you know? Hey. Anyway, clearly, I finished this book because I like to finish. <laughs> and probably no other reason. I feel like... I don't really want Rebecca Mackay to answer for her sins. Yet. But I feel like I should take a break. And be a long extended break. And knowing how the world works, I might never go back to her work. But this book and Big Swiss being like the big books of quarter one, they are not hitting. They are not hitting. And honestly, it makes me remember that there's a whole industry around talking about books, you know, reviewing books, publishers who are putting certain books before your eyes. And it reminds me that today morning I watched a video where th this guy was like hey feel free to not read popular books feel free you know like go read whatever you want to read like open a book look at it like for instance Layla which I talked about in my previous video was a book I probably would not have picked up but I really enjoyed it and this you know don't follow the hype kids then next was Mame by Jessica George, narrated by Heather Agyepong, which was a hybrid read. <laughs> ah! My friends, people who are comparing it to Queenie are right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Rights for Queenie. Not so rights for this book. But honestly, you know, rights because they have been written and also because I... I'm going to read these stories. I just know it. I just know it. I just know it. And I wish... I wish I did it! I wish I did it. Because this book follows our main character whose name is Madi. She's called Mame by her family, which means woman. And in a lot of ways, they like 
have been adultifying her throughout her life and basically making her the responsible child in the face of an older sibling who everybody just lets off the hook when we meet her she's living at home at 25 with her father who has parkinson's her brother has left home and basically gone to do whatever he feels like doing in the world so uh leaving their father in maddie's care because their mom also every so often just goes off to ghana their ghanaian british goes off to ghana for a year extended periods basically and leaves maddie and her father as the only ones in the house and this is one of those diasporic novels which increasingly i'm starting to fear that i should veer away from them because nobody comes out looking good and not that i want people to smell like roses but for instance madi is painted as being so out of touch with the world that gugu is basically her best friend she's like oh what does one do on a date what does one do at some point i was just like ah, 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 ah. Please, 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 please. I'm tired of these devices. Especially because they're not always doing things. They're not doing what they think they're doing. You know, like, homie, what was the reason for making a 25-year-old who's been to uni sound like a silly child? You know, I mean, actually, I take that back because children can be quite smart. I don't even know what the point was, but the author was doing a titular character no favors. And also she's written as being very out of touch with like Ghanaian customs or like the customs of her own ethnic group back in Ghana and so on, which is possible. It's possible that the parents just did not speak to them in the language and so on. But it's also like, where where does one start to take responsibility for their life and their connection to where they're from? When? At what point? Listen, people are praising this book up and down and maybe I'm not one to speak because also, I mean, like, there are Kenyans everywhere people are to be found. I mean, not on the same level as Nigerians, but, or like, say, Ghanaians or whatever. And Ghanaians and Nigerians have like a huge diaspora in the UK where this book is set. But I feel there's something to be said about, say, a person like me who's an East African reading this book. You know, maybe some things just do not hit for me. And we love to see a young woman, you know, decide to define herself separately from her family. We love to see her assert herself. Um, but I don't know. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Like, the extended universe of this type of book, you know, uh, black British woman coming into her own in her mid-twenties who seems to have a lot of growing up to do, some of which involves having sex. And in Mame, for instance, like, um, the way sex and sexuality were explored left a lot to be desired. Like, there was a bisexual character where I just felt... It just felt like a tinge, a tinge of biphobia to me. But, um, yeah, no. <laughs> no. And then I read The Hooker Plan, which is the third, of, the third book in the Boyfriend Project series by Farah Roshan. This book follows a doctor. Eh, eh, have I forgotten her name? Listen is not important let me just it is important but you can look it up um it follows our main character who is a doctor um who hooks up with her high school nemesis and then it turns out as with a lot of these romance novels that you all just made up stories about each other in your heads he did not dislike her the whole time in high school etc etc so they hook up and it turns out he's in town to probably structure the buyout of her public hospital. I'm not doing a good job of explaining this because, like, finance stuff. <laughs> I'm not saying I don't understand it, but anyway, he works for, like, a, pri uh, a consulting firm whose job is to do, you know, like, 
the sort of like feasibility studies to figure out should this entity be sold off should it be restructured should it be this should it be that and he's there to do that for the hospital she works at which is a public hospital but he also has his own trauma both of them have like their own like trauma narratives trauma storylines mm, but i enjoyed the fact that they it was this was a sort of relationship where they are kind to each other they are generous with each other which i always always absolutely love because we need more love and kindness and generosity in the world honestly and truly i mean i know i say this all the time and yeah it was just a sweet novel i will say one thing this novel went on too too long too too long like miss Rashawn, why did you have to write as a novel that was what was it like 400 pages long uh -uh, uh -uh. I'm not saying you need to write a novella or whatever, but like, eh, it took me so long to finish this novel because at some point I was just like, <sighs> another day, another day, like, wrap it up, wrap it up, wrap it up. But other than that, it was a really nice read. Then the last book I read this month was The Old Drift by Namali Sapel, which I read as, um, hybrid read so the audiobook is narrated by Ajo Ando, Richard E. Grant and Cobna Holbrook Smith. I picked this up this chunker like look at it look at it. I picked it up because I quite enjoyed The Pharaohs by Namali Sapel so this is her first novel The Pharaohs being her second. Um, this book is set in Zambia and also some other parts of the world but chiefly in Zambia and it follows a number of families which at the very end meet so it was so nice to pick up a book with a family tree I love a family tree I love a family tree as much as I'm Paul Lava map <laughs> so you know to each their own this had it had just a family tree no map but Listen, it was so good. Um, because it's so thick, it is 20 plus hours on audio. And I generally listen at 2 to 3x, depending on how fast the narrators are going. But even then, it made for a lot of listening. Like, I went for quite a number of walks, washed dishes, etc. listening to this book. And what is it about? I'm just going to read the flap. On the banks of the Zambezi River, a few miles from the majestic Victoria Falls, there was once a colonial settlement called The Old Drift, hence the title. Here begins the epic story of a small African nation told by a mysterious swam-like chorus that calls itself man's greatest nemesis. The tale, a playful panorama of panorama, panorama, <laughs> panorama of history, fairy tale, romance, and science fiction. The moral to R is human. And so we follow these. As I said different families and I found this swarm which we start off thinking are mosquitoes but then over time we find out there's something uh, such an interesting narrative device because I've read books where there are animals narrating and so on but I don't know I don't want to say the humble mosquito because malaria is a huge issue in Africa and in some other parts of the world but it was just so interesting to go down these different strands and i'm not gonna lie some families were more interesting than others and um some characters were more interesting than others that is to be expected with a book this thick there are times when it'll lag and that happened and the thing that helped for me was that there are no holes on the audiobook at the library so i kept renewing it so if you look at my story graph or my goodreads it's been read over quite a significant period of time but it's not because it's interesting it's because like i felt like it was so immersive and also i felt like it helped to take breaks between like each family and each segment and so on and the narration was so good i don't know if the for instance pronunciations of names like zambian names and so on is accurate but the way it follows all of these different families as this country transforms and we are also reading it we're not necessarily going through every family's time in zambia what is now zambia we 
uh, reading it in sort of like a linear fashion that leads us to connect all of these different families. And then we'll pick up with different families along the way as they merge and so on. And so the way it tackles race and ethnicity and gender, religion, politics, disease, because HIV, AIDS, um, which led to a massive crisis in so many African countries, including my own, Kenya, um, is a character in this book. And I can't remember the last time a disease was a character, um, especially considering one of the things that's discussed is human trials or vaccines and so on. And that's something that's familiar to me because Kenya, which is mentioned in the book actually, was a site of some of those um, HIV vaccine trials and so on. And of course, some of those conversations about vaccines came up with um, COVID-19 and vaccine inequity and so on. And so this book packs a punch, you know, and a bit of me wants now to read every interview you listen to, every podcast, maybe also, I don't know, go on someone's podcast or have somebody on my own podcast. I'm going to post a, lot, a link below. I forget it sometimes, but... I have one and I am actually recording an episode this weekend, so there will be something to share soon. But yeah, just, it did so much work um, with such a large cast of characters. I know I've mentioned Amin's story graph challenge in the past and I'm going to put a link again down below because one of its, of its prompts is to read a book with an ensemble of characters and this really fit the bill. But yeah, I greatly, greatly enjoyed it and, you know, I'm rooting for Namali Sapel at all times. She has won the Kane Prize for African Fiction. African, the Kane Prize for... What is its title? But the Kane Prize, which is awarded to a writer of a short story in the past. And yeah, I'll put some links to her short stories down below so you have a sense of what her writing is like. But yeah, she, she can write. She can write, write. And I must say also that one of the beauties of reading this book was sort of really getting immersed in Zambian history, of course, told from a certain perspective and so on, because I can't remember another Zambian writer I've written, I've read, written, writer I've read, and so I look forward to, yeah, more Zambian authors, because this one has really gotten me, you know, in the mood for writing from Zambia. So that's it. That's all the books I read in the week ending 17th march 2023 please like share subscribe comment and all of the good things and also down below tell me what you've been reading lately you know what you enjoyed lately because you know clearly getting out of my comfort zone oh before i forget this came from the book one library in gigiri same as leila which i mentioned in the february wrap-up so shout out to that library for you know Helping me read chunkers because in 2023, I'm trying to read more physical books and there's no better source of those than libraries. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Again, let me just go over that again. Please like, share, subscribe. Tell me what you've read lately, what you found interesting, what you'd recommend. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye.